Welcome to the unofficial House of Wind book club, ran by two best friends and self-declared members of the Night Court. Today we are discussing chapters 39 and 40 of A Court of Thorns and Roses. I know you can hear me from the dark. I know you're listening from afar. I was listening to that the other day just for fun and uh, James goes why is that so familiar <laughs> and I was like I don't know maybe because it's episode 20 and we've been doing this for like half of a year now I don't know Libby how is your week my week has been emotional I finished same I, I finished Tower of Dawn good bad ugly good <laughs> rough there were a lot of emotional roller coasters and i am not the biggest fan of kale by any means but this book definitely changed that for me good because you hated the fact i adored him i was ugh, i was disgusted and annoyed with him for so many reasons and this book was definitely the redemption I needed for him. Good. There were a lot of people, a lot of people that were like, can we just skip this book? And I was on that train, but there were even more people that were like, no. It took you a long time to get through this. It really did. It was rough. I was not as committed to hearing anything to do with Kale, let alone reading a whole book that was just dedicated to him, essentially. I think as long as you don't go into it, with the expectation that you're going to be miserable. Like, try not to have that mindset when you start. <laughs> You'll get through it a lot faster than I did. But there is so much information that you really can't skip the book. You can't not get the details. There's a lot that ends up happening. And it is a very emotional roller coaster. And you're going to need it so that you can understand. I'm, I'm pretty sure the things that you learn in this book are going to be essential for the last book, Kingdom of Ash. And now I'm having a hard time. Yeah, I don't think either of us are ready for that one. And I'm only on book four. So this is my only one left. And I'm having a hard time because I have yet to see one person say that they made it out of that book without breaking down sobbing. If you're listening to this podcast and you're not part of the Sarah J. Mass Facebook page, I don't know what's wrong with you. We'll put it in the show notes. Right. <laughs> um, it is fantastic. But I've seen so many posts of people just with like tears yes. down their face, sobbing, going, I finished the book. And I am not ready for that. There are people that say that they cried during the Akatar books or even in Crescent City. We know what moments there are in these books that will bring you to your knees. And they're like, that was nothing compared to Kingdom of Ash. And I'm not ready for that level of devastation, Abby. I just started book four, Air of Fire. I just finished Assassin's Blade. And mm, oh no, oh Abby, it did didn't make me as upset as I thought I was going to be. I didn't cry. Okay, I think I am a huge believer that you should read the book third. I agree. That's how I read it. Yes, Assassin's Blade should be third. If I would have read it the f as the first book, like a lot of people say they do, I feel like you'd have no information right. about the character. Right. And the next two books would be super hard to get through. Which, how long did it take me to get through the first two? Like. Two months? You blew through Assassin's Blade, so... Oh, yeah, because I was hooked. But the first two were a little a little tough. But now I'm like head over heels in love with the characters. I think it's hard to go into the Throne of Glass series after reading Akatar or Crescent City because the pace is so much faster. And then when you go to Throne of Glass, those first two books, they're not by any means slow, but comparatively, they're slower. It's it's a it's a climb. A lot. I think Assassin's Blade just kind of like took off. Yes. And now going back to Air of Fire after reading Assassin's Blade, it was almost like a reprieve. Yeah. And the storyline after such, you know, a heavy storyline to go and kind of know the backstory. And it's a much needed break. And it had me looking forward to Air of Fire the entire time because of the, the big info drop at the end of the second book. So I don't know, girl, not, SJM is ruining us. Crown of Midnight is heavy. There is a lot that happens in Crown of Midnight. 
Yeah. It's emotionally, <laughs> it's a heavy book. I, I struggled with some of the things, the events that occurred in Crown of Midnight. Air of Fire, I really, that one, oh man. Am I in for it now? I don't know if you'll be in for it or not. I think progressively you see the characters grow and become who they were meant to be. But doing oh. so, they're faced with some very heavy emotional baggage that they have to encounter, that they have to confront finally. They have to grow through the things that they went through in the past. They have to become stronger. They have to accept and get stronger and move on. And in Air of Fire, I feel like that happens pretty heavily. Well, it doesn't start off that way. There's a lot of regression in the beginning. The, the beginning, I thought, was very light and, and kind of funny in different ways. I liked Selena's start in Air of Fire. Oh, but she goes through it. Where she's just drunk walking around the city. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> just lost it. That's why I was like... <laughs> It, she's just not, she's done. It was actually, I kind of find it sad. There but. were moments though in Air of Fire that you will get to that felt, it wasn't similar. It, obviously it's not the same story, but it felt so similar to the feelings I, I felt while reading A Court of Silver Flames. Really? Okay. And what we find out, because that is Nesta's book. Um, and I guess a little bit of a spoiler there. Nesta has her own book. It's A Court of Silver Flames. And her story, oh, it's, it's emotional. She goes through quite a bit. And Air of Fire, I felt, was a not a similar journey, but a lot of similar emotions for the reader for what Selena goes through. Well, that is my favorite Akatar book, so we'll see. That's as lightly as I can put it. I did cry in Air of Fire. There were moments that my heart was just so heavy for Selena that it was just... But I cried a lot in Silver Flames, too. Livy, you know how you, your comfort book is uh, Mist and Fury? Oh, yes, yes. Your comfort audiobook? Um, I'm reading the dramatized version right now, or listening to the dramatized version, which is amazing. Oh. But my comfort read is Silver Flames, uh, hands down. They're releasing a dramatized version of Silver Flames coming soon. They're releasing a, a dramatized version of Throne of Glass series. Oh, finally. Oh, man. I know. Oh, gosh. <laughs> you and I both know these books are emotional. They say the first 80% is fine, and then you get to the last 20%, and everything just goes to shit. And good Lord. I'm going to be reading Air of Fire while my best friend's in town. So what? Okay, my older best friend. And you're telling me that I'm going to be sobbing during that? Or I'm not going to be able to put the book down during that? Look, this message is for Lindsay. She's going to need you. I need you to hold her while she goes through it. Just be there. You, she needs you right now, all right? <laughs> this is important. And I know she'll do it. Lindsay's amazing. Of course, she'll be awesome. She'll be she'll be the best person. Shout out to, to Lindsay as well. It's very annoying that you're coming right now because all I want to be doing is reading this dang book. <laughs> so I have to clean and things. Oh. oh, Libby, that brings me to my point, if, if that's okay. Yeah, to your point, your week. Please let us know. It's a lot lighter than, than this heaviness. It's not good. Oh, Oh, never mind. God, Abby. We'll give you the pros and cons. Pros. I got a new kitchen table. Ooh. And the one that we had in our kitchen was from our landlord, and it was very Italy and not a cute way. Okay. It was a little old and, and gross and wobbly. We're talking like 80s? We're talking like, no, like 70s. Whoa. Okay. Like laminate top it just wasn't cute and so it was a little big for the space and so i found one on facebook marketplace for twenty dollars twenty dollars kitchen table and like high quality kitchen chairs right very excited yeah and so i decided you know with the negative 10 free time i had this week and last week that i would paint the new kitchen table and paint my little armoire now Painting went great. Everything was fine. Once I finished painting the table, it, you know, it's uh, made out of wood, so it's pretty heavy. I'd say the table with all the legs and stuff is well over 100 pounds. Ooh, what a workout. Okay. I am strong lady and thought I can lift that up by myself. No problem. But I went to, you know, like flip the table over and uh, I used my back instead of my knees. Oh, Abigail, no. To flip the table. And I hurt my back really bad. Now, this is double trouble because, like I said, Lindsay's coming this week. So there's lots of stuff I have to do. And I have just been immobile in pain. Not only did I hurt my table with the back. No, that was my dyslexic brain. 
hurt my back with the table. There we go. I like the first one. That was funnier. <laughs> Me too. It's the time of the month. Mm. And so I feel like uh, the world was like, hey, you know how you're already struggling and already having back pain? It's not enough. Let's play a fun health game. Is it your back pain or is it your period? Correct. Both. There's no wrong answers. God. <laughs> yeah, it's both. And you played a shitty game and won a shitty prize. Yay. No prizes. No prizes. I took a last minute photo shoot too this week that I shouldn't have taken, but I scheduled it like a week before all this happened. I hurt my back on Sunday and Tuesday I had to be upright for an hour walking around cobblestone streets. I was going to say your photo shoots are usually <laughs> a hike up the mountains or uneven roads. Like you're not in easy ground. No. So like the last one I did, I actually shared it with our listeners. I went up to a castle and it was a hike, girl. Like I hike, it was a 10 minute hike, steep incline up to a mountain. Thank God this photo shoot wasn't that, but it was just, I had to wear a back brace to the shoot and I was hyped up on Midol and painkillers and <sighs> made it through. Today's the first day I had a photo shoot tonight that I felt like semi-human. Okay. Tomorrow I'm going to be walking around another... But this time a mountain town with hills and things. So wish me luck, friend, because I am broken. Well, I'm sort of book related, but not SJM related, book related words. Anyway, we jumped on board and we both pre-ordered the special edition fourth wing with the two additional chapters. Oh, yes, we did. So we have that to look forward to. Except you get yours two weeks before I get mine. Oh, oh no. I mean, fuck. I'm really bringing the mood down today, guys. This isn't getting better. Damn it. Here, no, we're, we're ending the segment with positive things. Okay. Here's my positive thing of the week. I thought my $800 lens was broken. This is positive. And have thought it was broken okay. for the last... Yeah, it gets positive. Okay. I thought it was broken for like the last month. I've been really sad about it. Turns out it is not broken. The like $50 adapter to the lens was broken and it's a new one's coming tomorrow. So that's positive. That's a, that's a big turnaround. Thank God. Yeah. It's like, I don't, I don't like a broken $800 lens. This is not the positive you just promised me. <laughs> Here's my positive thing. My lens is broken. <laughs> Damn it, Abigail. This is not better. Okay, more positive note. Libby, are you ready for the question of the week? Yes, I am. Question of the week this week. What is the first book series that you remember falling in love with? I gotta, that's like, I gotta go deep, deep into the tendrils of my memory. Deep into those trauma repressed memories. Did that happen or did I read it? Hmm. Oh my God, literally. If we're going like the literal first book series, right when I first started to learn, I was hardcore into Junie B. Jones. Loved those books as a kid. Oh. So if that's, what, if that's what you're talking about. Okay, so that's your first one. Do you have like a, a first like, Either fantasy or romance or dystopian novel that you were into? Well, okay. So I loved Junie B. Jones when I was little, little. As I got a little bit older, my brother and I were pretty hard into the Magic Treehouse books. Oh, I remember those. Yeah. I know. I'm talking like super innocent. I know what you're referring to. But like as a kid, like we read the Magic Treehouse books and <laughs> as someone who... <laughs> I don't know if it's like the tragedy or maybe I'm just, I was a really depressed kid. Probably. I read the um, Titanic Magic Treehouse one a lot. Oh. <laughs> I liked the Titanic. Now, my sister Samantha, obsessed over the Titanic. I don't know. We were, maybe we were really dark kids. Lindsay's obsessed over the Titanic. Like, maybe, maybe we need to go back and reassess our interests as children. <laughs> I think in middle school, I got really into Twilight when it first came out. I was definitely one of those girls that now I look back and cringe that I was so into it, but... I was into Twilight. I Like, I saw the movies as they came out, like, in the theaters, like, the day they came out, I would, I would go and see them. I made my mom take me to the first one, and then it was back when, like, you couldn't just, like, get movies on your TV right away. You had to wait a whole another year for it right. to come out on DVD. God, I feel old. <laughs> like, that it just feels normal, but nope, that was... Ugh. <laughs> These kids will never understand. <laughs> Back when DVDs existed, Netflix was mailed to your address on DVDs. We subscribed to plenty of streaming services. 
And one of them, we don't pay for no ads. And our daughter was like, what's a commercial? What is this? And we were like, oh, God. Oh. Is it Hulu? You have, you need to struggle more, child. <laughs> you need to get cable so she's forced. So I made my mom take me to the first, the, the Twilight, the first Twilight movie. And then she was like over it and not really wanted to see it again. So I tricked my dad's mom, who was... We don't really talk to her. Yeah, I'm not. Mm, she's not a great person. I hope she listens to this and knows that. Oh, great. <laughs> Susan, you suck. Anyway, <laughs> she <laughs> she's a very conservative um, person. She's got a lot of discriminations, very judgy. There's, there's, oh, lovely. I'm very justified in my choice to not have anything to do with them. Again, Susan, you're the worst. Anyway. We're going to blame everything on Susan now. I tricked her into taking me to go see <laughs> the movie again. So she sat through Twilight and then told my mom about how concerned she was that I was going to <gasps> kill myself because I was obsessed with vampires oh. and I would be confused, I guess, between <laughs> reality and <laughs> fantasy. It was a whole thing. She was super comfortable. She hated the whole thing and like she brought her own snacks. So she would like keep crinkling the bag because she was so uncomfortable. And eventually like I snapped and was like, would you stop? Stop it. Don't ruin this for me. I'm like 14. <laughs> Little teen Libby is just like. You're like, I need to see more of Edward. I, you don't understand. I've been reading about this and it's finally in theaters. I've seen it once. I need the, they need the fix. Ugh. So it, it was like the worst thing ever. And she, uh, yeah, she told my mom she thought I'd kill myself. And uh, there was so much. So you went from really innocent Junie B. Jones to Twilight. <laughs> no in between. I read other books. My mom had me read The Little House on the Prairie, which I hated. I hated those books so much. <laughs> we talk about books being slow. You know what? That sounds like something your mom would make you do. I'm glad she encouraged us to read as much as she did. We definitely always had more than enough books. We went to the library quite a bit. We had our own library cards, our books at home. Like we never went without books. We definitely got a lot and that. Oh, I read the Harry Potter books, obvious. I was really into those. Yeah, I, there was a rule in my mom in, in our house. My mom would not let us see the movies until we read the books. However, the movies were coming out as we were reading the books anyway when I was a kid. Oh, so it's not nice. like we had the movies ready to go. Like we had already been reading the right. books when the movies started getting released. So it wasn't a horribly painful wait. My best Christmas gift was the Harry Potter set. Okay. Yeah. I remember crying when I got it. I had two favorites. If we're talking kid, like when I was little, the Princess Diaries. The Princess Diaries. Okay. The Princess Diaries in high school, I really, really loved. And then funny enough, well, side note, there was a book about fairies and magic. It was, I don't remember what it was okay. called, but I, I loved that book series so much. And it was just funny that, of course, now I'm, you know, a grown yeah. ass adult who's also <laughs> reading the same kind of books. But then the, in high school, it was The Mortal Instruments. Okay. Which I will be rereading this winter once I get through TOG yeah. and all the new books that are coming out. I'm going to reread that. And then anything John Green. Oh, man. Oh. Anything John Green. All of them. I was obsessed with that man. And once I tweeted him and I was like, not only do I feel sick right now, but I just got told my John Green books aren't coming in because it got canceled and sent to the wrong address or something. And I tweeted at him and he responds saying, I'm sorry, buddy. Oh, oh. thank you. Thanks, John. Thanks, John Green. John, thanks very much, John Green. Now I'm like nostalgic. I want to like do a deep dive of all the books I read as a kid. And like, I'm not, I'm excited because our, our child is learning to read on her own more so I should say like she she was able to like start reading with like different sight words in the past but now like she's doing really good about when she sees words she doesn't know she's sounding them out and figuring out what they are on her own oh. or like we'll say a word and she'll like slow it down out loud and break it down and be like oh this is how you spell it right and we're like oh yeah so she has a lot of books that we've read to her but Libby, it's almost time for Akatar for her. Oh, she's no, no, not yet. Start off oh. with Silver Flames. <laughs> I will say I have read the, some SJM books out loud and like I change things like as I'm reading it that she shouldn't know about. I'll change things right. and she'll fall asleep to it sometimes. So technically oh. I usually stick with the more action scenes and then I'll just stop talking and she's like, what's going on? I'm like, nothing, nothing. I lost my place. I can't read. I just suddenly forgot how to read. Mm -mm. Can't read this one. Can't do it. 
but she's learning to read and it's exciting and i want her my bird's head chopped off <laughs> Ooh. i want her to read oh my god <laughs> he fell asleep forever that wasn't i meant more so the like like chapter 54 of the court of miss and fury stuff like that yeah oh books let me our poor listeners are we ready for chapter time i know we've had a lot to say and i hope our listeners like it because chapter 39 was a bitch of a chapter (laughs) you have a doozy I didn't even think about it. How many pages do you have? It said it was like 12 or 13 on my tablet, <laughs> but it kept going and it was like, there's no way. There's no way. Because like I turn a page and it'd be like still 12 pages left. I'm like, no, you said that three pages ago. What is happening? Oh my gosh. Well, are we ready? Do you want to start this never ending? Cha- it's finally your turn for a never, never ending chapter. Right. I actually thought that I was like, you know, I think I'm due. Abby's had so many of them. I think it's fair. In a row. Poor Abby. <laughs> Mine was only eight pages this time. <laughs> All right. Chapter 39. I'm going to just crochet, friend. You live your life. You're going to get a lot of crocheting done. You're going to be finished with that cardigan by the end of my chapter. Don't worry. (laughs) My Akatar cardigan. I love it. Chapter 39. After Rhysan had glamoured the guards, Favor was now being provided hot, fresh meals every morning and evening. Favor wasted no time digging in, but was sure to curse Rhysan's name while doing so. Favor had nothing to do to pass the time, but brood over Amarantha's riddle and was still coming up short for an answer. Days were passing, and other than her meals appearing, Feyre was left alone. Well, alone with the endless screaming that persisted in the dungeons. She would watch her tattoo and wonder if it was a reminder of Jurian's fate, soon to be similar to her own. She would speak to it once in a while, always feeling foolish when she did. Feyre counted her meals and attempted to keep track of the passing days. It might have been four since she had last seen Rhysan in his room. Two high fae females appeared through the darkness of her cell, like Rhysand would. Rhysand was tangible, touchable, solid. These two fae females were made of shadow, almost ghost-like. As they reached and touched Feyre, she realized that they too felt tangible and only appeared translucent. Feyre assumed that they were night court servants sent by Rhysand. As they held onto Feyre, they were all three able to walk through the solid closed door. As if by holding her, Feyre was a shadow now too. Feyre's knees were weak from the feeling of walking through the material item, and as they continued through the dungeons, nobody thought twice about the now wandering prisoner or looked in Feyre's direction at all. They must have been glamoured, Feyre thought to herself. The Fae brought her to an unremarkable room and stripped her down bare. Feyre was bathed with no gentleness. The Fae then began to paint her body with cold brushes, not missing an inch. Feyre felt most uncomfortable at the paint being applied to her intimate part. They offered her no reason for any of this. Feyre felt she couldn't escape without damning Tamlin to an even worse fate than he was already facing. With Tamlin in mind, Feyre didn't fight back. Feyre didn't ask questions. Feyre's face was majestic. Rouge adorned her lips. Gold dust glowing across her eyelids with coal lining her eyes. Her hair was curled around a golden diadem, garnished with lapis lazuli gems. From the neck down, well, Favor could be a siren, a temptress, anything unwelcome in a place of holy worship. The tattooed pattern had been continued on with blue-black paint all over her body. Once the paint was dry, Favor was clothed in a white dress that came over her shoulders to cover her breasts, but left the most of her backside exposed then joined at the hip in one piece that hung between her legs. Covered was a generous word, as the fabric required no imagination for what lay below it. Favor demanded to be clothed in something else and tried to rip the flimsy fabric off, but was warned by a deep, melodious voice not to do that. Rhysand leaned in the doorway with his arms crossed. Favor snapped back, reminding him that their bargain had not yet begun. All instincts she had with Tamlin and Lucian to remain silent and careful disappeared instantaneously when she was around Rhysand. Rhysand goaded that he needed an escort for the party, and that the thought of Favor squatting in a dungeon cell alone all night he trailed off waving his hand to dismiss the fey servants he playfully told her she looked just as he hoped she would fair questioned if the paint and the gown were really necessary of course Rhysand bantered how else would he know if anyone were to touch her he ran his finger along her shoulder to show the now smudged paint which fixed itself once his finger was removed. The dress and her movements would have no effect on the paint. Rhysand moved in closer, teeth too close for comfort near her throat, as he assured her that he would know precisely where his hands would be on her body, but anyone else's hands, well, he would know if they were on her such as a certain high lord of the spring court. Rhysand forewarned her that he didn't like his belongings being tampered with. 
Rhysand may own her once a week every month, but Feyre worried that he now thought it extended to the rest of her life, too. Come, we're already late, Rhysand directed, summoning her with an outstretched hand. As they approached the throne room, Feyre dreaded the exposure of her body to the upcoming crowd. Faye gawked at her as they passed through the entrance, some bowing to Rhysand, others gaping at them. Several of Lucian's older brothers cunningly smiled at Feyre. Rhysand didn't lay a hand on her, but there was no doubt from their closeness that she belonged to him. Feyre held her head up high when approaching Amarantha. She had beaten her first task and would proudly stand before the cruel female. Tamlin was seated beside Amarantha, and Feyre felt fury for Rhysand, knowing he would use the bargain and this to hurt Tamlin. Amarantha wondered what Rhysand had done to her captive. Rhysan coolly revealed that he and Feyre had made a bargain. The throne room was silent. Feyre studied Rhysan's face and wondered what role she was now playing in Rhysan's game. Rhysan played Mitty, and she was absolutely his pawn. Amarantha released them with a command to enjoy her party. The party kept their distance from Feyre, and she stood tall with her head held high, not allowing them to see any weakness. Rhysan approached and offered Feyre wine, to which she first declined. He smiled coyly and told her to drink. She would need it. Feyre reminded herself of Alice's warnings not to, and refused again. Rhysand commanded her to drink, and Feyre did. Feyre woke in her cell to the room spinning, and barely made it to her corner to vomit the fey wine that she had consumed the night before. Once there was nothing left to upheave, she dragged herself to the opposite corner of her cell and collapsed. Most of her day continued on this way. As she was picking out her evening meal, Lucian slipped into the cell, and immediately complained of the freezing conditions and draped his cloak over Feyre. Lucian took in the paint, which was mostly intact, all over Feyre's body and cursed lowly. Feyre asked him what had happened, but Lucian warned her she wouldn't want to know. Feyre asked who had smudged the paint along her hips, but they both knew who had done it. Rhysand wanted to rile up Tamlin. It was all intentional. Unfortunately for Rhysand, his attempts to enrage Tamlin were all in vain. Tamlin wasn't phased. Lucian told Feyre how she was made to dance provocatively with Rhysand, and when she wasn't dancing, she was seated quite comfortably upon Rhysand's lap. And yes, everyone had seen the events unfolding. Lucian snapped at Feyre, exclaiming that she should have known he would come to help her. She didn't need to resort to Rhysand's help. Feyre threw back at him, I was dying. Her fever had been rising, and humans couldn't last long against those. Lucian defended himself, saying that he swore an oath to Tamlin, but Feyre interrupted, saying that she had no other choice and wasn't sure if she could even trust Lucian after everything he had said to her in the Spring Court manner. Lucian told her that she should have known he would be loyal to her after she offered up her name to save him here under the mountain. Feyre reiterated that she had no other choice. Feyre told Lucian that what's done was done, so he didn't need to hold to any oaths Lucian had promised to Tamlin to protect or save her from Amarantha. Lucian joked that he was relieved she was still just as lively and stubborn as always. Feyre muttered that it would only be a week out of every month, but Lucian assured her that they would be addressing that when the time came. Lucian made to leave, but Feyre gently spoke to tell him she was sorry that he was punished for helping her. She had heard what Tamlin had to do to him. Lucian shrugged it off, and Feyre thanked him for helping her. Lucian told Feyre that he couldn't come sooner because Amarantha had used their powers to keep his back from healing. He hadn't even been able to move until this day. Feyre removed Lucian's cloak and attempted to return it, but he stopped her. She should keep it. He had stolen it off a sleeping guard on his way in the cell anyways, and he was tired of seeing so much of Feyre. Lucian again went to leave, but Feyre stopped to ask him if Tamlin was okay, considering the spell he had been put under by Amarantha. Spell? There was no spell, Lucian told her. Tamlin was keeping quiet so Amarantha wouldn't know which form of torment to use on Feyre to affect him. It was all a dangerous game. They were all playing it. Night after night, Feyre was bathed, painted, and dressed. Feyre was made to accompany Reese, drink the Fey wine, black out, and perform who knows what dehumanizing acts. All on repeat. Feyre was becoming known as Rhysand's plaything and the harlot of Amarantha's whore. She would wake with the distant memories of sitting between Rhysand's legs and being touched along her waist by his hands. She would dance until she was sick, then continue on dancing again. She would wake exhausted and sick and spend her day combing through the possibilities for Amarantha's riddle, still coming up with no answers. Through it all, Feyre held on to one moment every night. The moment when she would look into Tamlin's eyes and didn't hold back all the love and pain she was enduring for him. Rhysand entered the room one evening and revealed to Feyre that her second task would be the following night. It could be her last night. Would she beg him for a night alone with her beloved? 
No, Feyre was determined to have that night and all the others once she beat Amarantha's final task. Rhysand grinned at this and remarked out loud how he wondered if Feyre had been this prickly when she was Tamlin's captive. Feyre disputed that she was never treated like a captive or a slave with Tamlin. Rhysand asked Feyre how Tamlin could treat her that way at all when the brutality of his father and brothers weighed on him so heavily. Feyre hit below the belt and reminded Rhysand that his court had fallen too. Sadness washed over Rhysand's violet eyes. Feyre studied the eye in her palm and wanted to ask more of it. It, but instead asked Rhysand what his fire night freedom had cost him. Rhysand's gaze turned from sadness to hard cold, and he made it clear that what he did for his court was none of her concern. Favor wanted to know what it was Amarantha had been doing to them for the last 49 years. Holding them there? Torturing them? To what end? But Rhysand simply said that Amarantha needed no excuses for her actions. Favor tried to protest, but Rhysand ushered her along to the gathering. Favor demanded to know what more Rhysand wanted with her beyond torturing Tamlin. But torturing Tamlin was all the reason Rhysand needed. However, if that wasn't enough, then why shouldn't a male simply enjoy the presence of another female? Favor reminded Rhys that he had saved her life. Rhys reminded her that by saving her life, Tamlin's was also saved. Why? Favor wanted to know. Rhys winked at her and left her to ponder the realization that this was the real question. As they entered the throne room, Lucian's brothers honed in on Feyre and made their way to her. Reese murmured for her to stay close and keep her mouth shut. Feyre now saw that Lucian's brothers weren't coming for her, but for Rhysand. Before them was a fey male sobbing on the floor before the dais. Amarantha had a venomous smile across her face and was enjoying the male's misery so much that she paid no mind to Feyre's presence at all. Tamlin sat beside her, seemingly unaffected as usual. Rhysand warned and commanded with his eyes for Feyre to stay at the edge of the crowd. Feyre did so and immediately averted her gaze to Tamlin urging with her eyes for him to look at her just once while the cruel queen was too distracted to notice. Amarantha caressed the ring encasing Jurian's eye and informed Rhysand as he approached of the summer lordling before her who had attempted to escape the spring court. Amarantha wanted to know why. Rhysand slid his hands into his pockets and moved closer to the weeping male on the ground. The summer fay nearly wet himself at the mere sight of Rhys. Rhysand appeared at ease, but Favor knew his talons were wrapped around the summer male's mind. The male was frozen, but pain was shining through his face. After some silent time passed, Rhysand spoke. The summer male wanted to cross into the human territory and flee. He had worked alone, no accomplices. He was simply a pathetic coward. The male had indeed now pissed himself and was sitting in a pool of it. Amarantha disappointedly slouched back and flicked her hand. Shatter him, Rhysand. The High Lord of the Summer Court was given permission to do as he wanted with the body afterwards. Rhysand removed a hand from his pocket and curled his fingers. Amarantha now complaining of boredom. Rhysand then curled his fingers into a fist. The Summer Male slumped to the floor entirely, now dead. Blood leaked from his nose and ears onto the floor where his body now lay. Amarantha snapped that she said to shatter his mind, not his brain. Tamlin remained unmoved despite the events unfolding around him. Rhysand offered his apologies, then aimed his steps to the back of the throne room. Favor fell and stepped behind him. Favor tried not to think of the fey male on the ground or of Claire Better, who was still nailed to the wall. A few fey shot whispered hisses of horror at Rhysand as they walked by. Many others smiled appreciatively of Rhysand for having killed the traitor. Favor was willing to wager that the summer fey had indeed had accomplices and that his death was one of mercy. Favor again wondered what games Rhysand was playing. Once they got to the back of the throne room, Rhysand handed Feyre her goblet of fey wine and poured one for himself. They drank their glasses and remained silent until the wine swept Feyre away into oblivion once more. Then done. Only 74 years. <laughs> there were so many. You did good, buddy. Now I gotta read a chapter. I have to. I wrote this at 10 p.m. last night. You're welcome. You're welcome, editing Libby. <laughs> Chapter 40. It was time for her second task. Feyre found herself in a decently large room without any decorations or furniture, except for the wooden chair Amarantha sat on. Tamlin was behind her. The adder smiled their terrifying smile at Feyre, but she tried not to pay it any attention. But try as she might, Feyre was still petrified as Amarantha declared the second trial was to begin. As she spoke, the eye ring, Jurian, turned to look at her. Amarantha asked if Feyre had solved the riddle yet. 
but Feyre didn't answer her. Amarantha said she was feeling generous and wanted to offer Feyre a little practice. Feyre remained outwardly unfazed, just as Tamlin was. Feyre looked up to Tamlin and saw his gaze upon her. She wanted nothing more than to be able to hug him or simply feel his skin against hers for just a second. Time froze between them for a moment before reality slammed back into her as a hissing sound came from across the room. Amarantha glared at Tamlin. Begin, Amaranth had said, before the floor began to shake under Feyre as she was lowered into the pit. People laughed around her, but Feyre found Tamlin's eyes and again held them until she fully declined. Feyre searched around her new surroundings for an escape or an idea of what she was about to face, but only saw four walls. Three were made out of stone, but the fourth wasn't a wall at all. It was a grate that when she looked through, her heart sank. She saw him chained to the floor, Lucian. He looks like a wild animal who's terrified and trapped. She heard the fairies above her begin to talk, heard the sound of gold being traded between them. She wondered if her only bidder would bet on her again tonight. Above her, she saw four redheads and knew it to be Lucian's brothers laughing at his demise. Feyre looked for Lucian's parents but found them to be missing from the crowd. Amarantha presented the task to Feyre. It was a simple task. Answer the question by selecting the correct lever. If she selected the wrong one, she'd die. Amarantha said that she thought she was giving Feyre an unfair advantage by only having three levers to select from, but Feyre had to solve the puzzle in time. On cue, above them, two spike-covered grates began to slowly lower from the ceiling. Feyre realized that the grate between the two was so that Feyre would have to sit by and watch as Lucian and herself were squished by the heavy metal spikes. Feyre looked to the other wall where there were three stone levers with the numbers one, two, and three on them and above them a long riddle. Feyre couldn't read anything past the simple words she recognized, like the words the and but. The spikes continued to descend. The iron was burning hot and Feyre could feel the heat emulating from them. Feyre wondered who had told the queen she couldn't read. She looked to Lucian and only realized he was too far away to be able to read the inscription. She was going to die. Die by metal spikes that were so hot they were causing sweat to beat on her skin. Death by hot metal spikes. She tried to read, but no words came from her efforts. Lucian screamed at her to answer it and panic rised in her chest. She couldn't quit thinking about how slow and painful her imminent death would be. Lucian screamed her name. The fairies above her laughed. One, two, or three. Three lovers in front of her. Two would kill her. One would save her. One, two, three. Three. Lucian screamed at her just to choose one as the spikes continued their slow march towards their death. Feyre decided on the number two, because two was a lucky number. Tamlin and her, two people. She thought one had to be bad because it was lonely, like the queen. Three might be too many, like her sisters squashed together in the tiny cottage. It had to be two. Feyre prayed to the cauldron and to fate to please let the answer be two. She reached for the second lever when pain shot through her hand. She looked down to see the tattooed eye narrowing at her. She thought she was losing her mind as the grate was now just six feet above her head. She reached for the second lever again, but the pain forced her to stop. She reached towards the first lever and felt the pain again, but the third... The third had no pain. She looked up to the High Lord of the Night Court to see if he was playing games with her, but he only looked bored. She had nothing left but to trust him. Please, screamed Lucian. She closed her eyes and reached for the third lever. The spikes were only inches from her head, but they had stopped moving. Then relief hit her as the grate was lifted up to the ceiling and cold air hit her face. She had won. She was alive. It hit her that she almost died because she was illiterate. Words her inability to read them, had nearly caused her death. She fell to her knees and felt tears burning in her eyes. The spiral began. She would never free Tamlin or his people, never be the third task. She was worthless and stupid and pain shot through her arm again. Don't let her see you cry, the voice inside her head said. Put your hands at your sides and stand up. She couldn't. Stand. Don't give her the satisfaction of seeing you break. She, seemingly against her own will, stood up. Once she was brought up to Amarantha's level, she looked in the eyes hers free of tears. Count to 10. Don't look at Tamlin, just stare at her. She did. She listened to it and the voice was the only thing that kept her from spiraling out of control. She counted just like she was told and kept Amarantha's stare. Good girl. Now walk away. Turn on your heel. Good. Walk towards the door. Keep your chin high. Let the crowd part one step after another. His voice was the only reason she made it back to her cell in one piece, but the second the doors closed, Feyre let the dam break. The flood of tears lasted for hours. She cried for everything and everyone. Feyre felt like she couldn't ever stop, not even to breathe. Sobs racked her as the thought that the only reason she had won had been due to cheating repeated in her mind. The walls were closing in again, and then he was there. 
not Tamlin. She hadn't even had the hope to wish it was him. Brisian asked if she was done weeping. He said tears were unnecessary because she had beaten the second task. Feyre continued to cry as Brisian began to laugh. He knelt down to grasp her wrists, forcing her hands down from her face. She tried to pull away from his violet stare, but he was too strong. She could only sit and watch as he leaned forward and licked away her tears. One by one, he licked them away, even daring to trail up to her eyelashes before Feyre jerked back. He laughed again as she wiped her face and glared at him. He simply said that he had thought it would get her to stop crying. Feyre retorted that it was disgusting, but the High Lord lifted a brow. He said he could have sworn that he felt something other than disgust from her. She demanded that he get out of her cell now. Who would have thought that the self-righteous human girl couldn't read? Feyre again demanded of the High Lord, but this time to keep his damn mouth shut. But he said he wouldn't dream of telling another soul. She called him a disgusting bastard. He said he'd spare her the escort duties for the following day, but after that she was to look her finest. He asked her before leaving if assigning her to learn to read would be just as painful as it looked earlier that day. He disappeared into darkness before Feyre could attack him. Instead, she screamed every curse word she could think of at the tattooed eye on her hand. After a long time, Feyre realized that Resant, whether he knew it or not, had kept her from completely shattering. Which is so cute. I almost wonder if he was trying to shock her into not focusing on all the trauma that just happened to her. I mean, he all he says is like, I figured that would get you to stop crying. So yeah. If my if my husband started licking my tears, we'd we'd have to have a talk. <laughs> I felt so uncomfortable reading it and writing it. It was so icky. <laughs> I'm like, oh, you licked her face, my guy? And she got turned on by it. Could you imagine if your husband came up when you were crying and he just goes, you know what? Oh, God. No, I'd be like, get your tongue away from me. My face, when I read the book, would be the same as if he did it. Like, I was just like, oh, God. Like, just shock and disgust. Gross. Like, oh, oh, no. Mm -mm. Feyre is very adventurous. You can tell from her interests, from the things that she seems to be turned on by in this book <laughs> i don't think she even knows what's happening so i don't think she knows what she does and doesn't like yet i think she's just like let's try all of it it all seems interesting there's only a two page difference between our chapters but i feel like a lot happened in yours i think there was a lot of information because as i was reading through and gathering my notes for the summary it felt like every single page had a myriad of information that I couldn't just glide over. I had to include all of the crazy, the, the fey females, the shadowy females that just showed up in her cell and took her and stripped her down. Which, how creepy, how creepy these ghosties come in and they're like, yo, you gotta come with us. And we're going to bathe you and paint your boobies and your, your hoo-ha. Your lady bits. All of it. <laughs> Fair was like, I feel uncomfortable that there's paint in my vagina. And I was like, yeah, me too, buddy. Uh, yeah, I don't think anyone, maybe, hey, good for you if you do. I would not like that. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's not my personal cup of tea, but good for you. The only thing I would be focusing on is how do I get it out? Like, how do I clean it off? Like, this is going to take so much. She's already proven that she's not good with infections. I don't think we need to add a UTI or yeasty <laughs> in there. Why is it purple down there, Feyre? I don't know. <laughs> That's what we see us into. It didn't say washable either. <laughs> it wasn't Crayola washable paint, guys. Oh, no. It was the permanent. Oh, not acrylic. And I love how Reese is like, so I know who touches you. Oh. I'm like, I'm sorry. You don't own her yet, sir. That that was that gave me a lot of mixed emotions when he's like got his teeth up by her neck and he's like, I, I will know who touches you. And it's like, whoa, ho. like claim he is staking to Feyre. And at the same time, he is staking a claim to a person. And it's just there's a lot of back and forth for me here where I'm just like, this is a very seductive moment, but also stop it. Stop it. <laughs> I, I get what you're trying to do, but I don't like it. Right. I'm like, I don't want to, I don't want to like this. I don't, this is not what I, my morals and beliefs align with. And I've seen so many people talk about if someone actually did to me or to like them, what people do in books 
it, it would not garnish the same reaction. It'd be a lot of police phone calls. I don't know. I think I would give the same reaction when it comes to the uh, face licking of tears. Oh, that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was the one honest, most honest, real reaction that we can all be like, yeah, that was... What the hell? That was it. <laughs> Gosh. What do you feel of her in the, the Fey wine? Oh, I'm so torn. I'm so torn because I get... She got drugged. She did. She absolutely got drugged. She got roofied. But I don't think I'd want to remember those things either. So, like, I don't approve of what happened by any means. I'm not okay with it. But, uh, and I hate saying but. I don't like, I don't like to have to say this at all. I'm, God, relieved isn't a right word here. Relieved? I'm glad she's not smacked in the face with the the memories of the things she's forced to do every night. Let me play devil's advocate here. She didn't have a choice in the matter. Oh, no, it's not okay. I don't condone it or agree with it. Does it make your view of Resan change at all? Yeah, I don't like it. I don't like it. Yeah, it feels dirty. That's very villainous. This was this one. This was a very dark line to cross. I was like, I've enjoyed the playfulness of his villainness, but this this was too far. This was not. This wasn't as fun. Okay, but you say it was too. I'm just playing devil's advocate because it's fun. Because it's fun to throw me left and right here. God. Yes. <laughs> you say it's too far. At the same time, you were like. I'm relieved that she doesn't have to live through that. So is he making a hard decision? I can only hope that that's his mindset is that he's trying to do what he thinks is a kindness for her. It doesn't make it okay though. And I'm not saying like, I think it's a good thing she doesn't remember. I'm saying she's going through this with everything happening. God, it's not even a silver lining. Fuck, because there's just no good way to say that I'm glad she doesn't have to relive the trauma over and over again. <laughs> I just don't like any of this. Please just take this over, please. You you handle the tough stuff. Damn. <laughs> what if this Fey wine, because we don't really know how it affects a human. Okay. What if it's temporarily blocking Ooh. her ability to, rem- to remember, but like down the line, all of it's going to come crashing back to her? Wouldn't that suck? Yeah. Gosh, I hope that's not the case. Because then it makes me wonder, is he doing this to help her just get through right now? And like, is it him trying to, in a very warped way, be kind? Even though that's, guys, that's nothing kind. Don't do that. You don't get to decide what people have to, what they should and should not face. (laughs) I'm being nice by putting this date rape drug in here. (laughs) You are not a nice guy. You... You, you are bad. That is icky and you are an icky person. You don't get to decide those icky. things. You stop right now. Ew. Ugh. Ugh. Ew. Anyway, it's either that or if he does know it's going to temporarily block her out, then he's essentially setting her up to have the worst crash ever when it all comes flooding back in. But do you think he's doing it out of care for her or out of ease of dealing with her? You know what I mean? Like... Because if she remembered all these Lord only knows atrocious things. I know it's going to be weird to stick with me here. It's ickier to me if he's doing it to be caring. Because like I said, you you don't, you don't get to decide what someone can and can't handle and you don't get to drug them. I feel like if he was like, look, you're not going to want to remember this. This will take these, like if he, if he would have just like kind of given her a heads up Instead of just deciding, here, just drink this and not telling her what was going to happen, clue her in, I guess. Like, I think that's what frustrates me so much about the, this book so far is that everyone's making these decisions for Feyre and not telling her why or what could happen. They're just like, just trust me. Just trust me. This whole book is just trust me. It's like, why? Why should she? Why can't you just trust her and give her the opportunity to not trip you up? Because she's the human. And that's what's so shitty about the whole situation. And yet she's the more loyal and more reliable than any of these characters have been to her. But also, think of it this way. How old is Rasand? Gotta be at least Tamlin's age. So like at least 500, right? Minimum of 500 years old. So you gotta think, he sees this 20-year-old human... Mm. which if we're putting comparatively it's like a a puppy true he sees this puppy and he's like i know what's best for you because i've lived 50 of your lives you know i guess i would feel nothing makes me feel good here i would feel better (laughs) i think i feel good about it (laughs) i don't get warm and fuzzies and with any of this i think i could be 
not understanding, I could I could be more willing to see his perspective if that's what it is, is that he doesn't know if she's trustworthy or if, yeah, if she is essentially just this puppy that he has to make the decisions for, maybe that's his mindset is that he has to do that. He has to think that way. Because she doesn't know better. Right. Maybe he needs to be made aware and enlightened. He needs to do some research and take a step back and check his fey privilege. His high lord privilege. His high lord fey privilege. Immortal privilege. <laughs> And realize that she's not just some dumb pet. Human. (laughs) Yeah. I get really irritated in this chapter, in my chapter. Feyre even says she doesn't fight back against these two Fae servants who just stripped her down and bathed her aggressively and painted her. Because she's so worried. What's she supposed to do? Well, no. She says that she doesn't fight back because she's more worried about causing more problems for Tamlin. Ew. Not even about... She can't escape or it's all about she doesn't want Tamlin to get affected. Poor Tamlin. I'm like, this man has more opportunity and power and everything advantage than you have to make an escape to fight back. He has more in his corner than what you have. And you are so worried about protecting him yet again. And it speaks volumes to me that she very specifically, Best DSJM says she doesn't ask questions. She doesn't fight back when it comes to Tamlin and Lucian. When she's with Tamlin and Lucian, she instinctually knows to shut up and do what she's told. Yet when she's with Rhysand, suddenly she doesn't feel that way. She fights back. She voices her concern. She is her herself. She is a person, an actual being who speaks for herself and does things You know what it reminds me of? Do you remember your first crush and how you felt like you had to be everything they wanted? I think that was more than my first crush. That was like all middle school Libby with any of her crushes. Okay, you felt like you had to do whatever would make them the happiest. Whatever would make their... Oh, absolutely. Them like you or want you. You wanted to be what they wanted you to be. Yes. Exactly. And that's what I feel like is happening with Feyre. She is trying to be this docile, sweet, perfect person for Tamlin that the spring court needs. But the minute she's with Rasan, she's like, I don't care how you see me. I'm going to be me. And I think that we all get to that point where we're just like, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be someone I'm not. And Favor needs to get there. She needs to get tired of putting on the act and being someone that's not true to herself. She needs to get, <laughs> she needs to get to that point. We can't push her through it. She has to get there on her own. And eventually like we all do, she will have to realize she needs to find, at least in my opinion, somebody who likes her, who likes the the argumentative, the, the smart aleck, the, the wise ass, uh, uh, stubborn, all of the things, and doesn't see them as things to be fixed, but as things to be admired for. I feel like my husband... Uh, I am very much myself with my husband. Yeah. And I mean with you and, and Lindsay too, but other people have commented and been like, oh my God, Abby she reminds me of Sunshine. She's a like happy person. And she, you know, cause that's how I am with other people. <laughs> and then like, you know me and I am the crabbiest, bitchiest person there is. <laughs> and that's what, that's what I'm seeing with Feyre. Like to Tamlin, she's sweet and docile and lovey lovely and everything that he wants but with with research she's like screw you dude i do not give a single shit what you think right before i met my husband i decided i was done dating for a while and i did not want to be the person that i was always presenting myself to be this happy put together sociable like just all the things that most people are like wow what, what a great perfect little person right i was tired of it i was like i'm going to just be myself i'm going to be honest about who i am who my family is who who we are like what my life looks like the things i do and i don't like and if they don't like that then it's better to find out early on And I don't get hurt. Instead of pretending. Right. Like I don't waste time and get emotionally attached and create these bonds with people that it's never going to go anywhere. It's never truly going to work out with when I start to be comfortable in myself because they don't want that person. They want fake Libby. Right. (laughs) And so I was like that. I'm not doing that anymore. And the first person I met was my husband right after (laughs) that uh, realization and that new concept I took on. And I kept thinking, you know, he's either going to be here or he's not. And I kind of kept waiting and waiting for him to run away. Like, no, 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 no. And he didn't. And I was like, oh, 
this this is interesting. It's almost like the the good people for you will take you in whatever phase of life you're in. Exactly. Yes. Shocking. I wish I could scream that to Feyre right now. But you and I both know she has to be, make that decision for herself. You can't yeah. you can't tell someone to take on that that mindset and then they just do it. They have to decide for themselves that that's what they want to do. They have to be okay with being by themselves and not being attached to someone else and liking themselves and being like, I, this is the person I am and who I'm going to present to the world. So that way, when other people see who they truly are, they can decide if they like that person. And it won't matter if they don't because you like yourself. I mean, even let's move on past your chapter into the the second task. As she's going down, like literally descending all she does is look for Tamlin. Mm. Like, not looking down to see where she's going. The only thing she's worried about is catching Tamlin's gaze. Yeah. Miss Ma'am, you're probably going to die. Right. Like, how about we look around and figure out what, what task we have to fix? I mean, shoot the fey male in the summer court when, like, she's like, oh, I mean, this guy, she knows he's about to be killed. And she's like, just urging Tamlin with her eyes look at me look at me look at me this is our chance and she that's all that's all she can think about there's people around her he's pissing himself on the floor Rhysand's about to shatter his freaking mind and she's just like please look at me please please look at me Tamlin Tamlin I would be glued to be like what the fuck like that'd be terrifying a torturous thing to watch I wouldn't be looking to make googly eyes there's no way my mind could go to that point <laughs> it's just exactly what she's doing yes she throws out all worry and concern for herself and everybody else when it comes to tamlin tamlin literally takes over and casts this shadow over every aspect is it love or is it infatuation libby at this point because what does she really have to love i think it's infatuation i think this is the first person who on some level showed her an ounce of kindness well, yeah, showed her kindness, but like also kind of listened to her in some ways because Tamlin did hear, I want to paint. And he provided those things to her. It wasn't just them talking. He did give her things and make her feel somewhat seen and recognized. And that to her was so huge that I think she immediately was like, I love him. I love him. But you don't have... <laughs> it's one of those if he wanted to he would those aren't an example tamlin providing paint isn't a if he wanted to he would example right that's literally him having a bunch of money and sending his servants to go collect items for him and clean a room that wasn't him going out of his way if he wanted to he would you know i don't know i just <laughs> devil's advocate here Reese Ann wanted to keep her alive a few times now, and it really seems like he's been doing that. He's been putting himself on the line. And every time he's not made an excuse, speaking of this freaking second task, he uses the bond, and you know he, like, he is forbid from aiding her. Yes. Like, he's not allowed to tell her which one's correct. So he works around that and just tells her which one's wrong, right? He's still trying to help her. If he wanted to, he would. That is the example of if he wanted to, he would. What's Tim Tam the monster man doing? Fucking sitting there. Staring off into oblivion. At Amarantha's sides, gl glancing at her. He's Lucian defending him like maybe he's doing it because he doesn't want Amarantha to know which form of your torture hurts him the most. I'm sorry. That is a baby bitch answer. It was a bullshit answer because that didn't tell me he didn't want her to know what's hurting you. It was literally... I, he just doesn't want to have to watch you in ways that hurt him. Okay, that still is Tamlin focus. No part of that was protecting Feyre. I was going to say, and? Right, how did that help Feyre? That did nothing for her. If Tamlin wanted to be there for her, he'd fuck it. He'd, he'd look her in the fucking eyes and give her motivation and take on whatever punishment Amarantha dished out to him. Or say, I love you, or try to fight back literally maybe like a half of an inch. Literally anything. Instead of just standing there deadpan and... He, this is the thing that pisses me off. His, quote, love of his life is going for a second task where she could die. Yep. And the only thing this little baby boy does is glances at her. I am sorry. What? He wasn't the one that yelled, to your left, during the worm. No. Nope. That was Lucian. He is not doing 
anything. And you can, you, uh, the Tamlin supporters can give me all this bullshit saying it's because he's trying to keep her safe. How is that helping her in any way, shape, or form? It doesn't. You know what he should do if he really wanted to help? Find the form of torture that hurts her the least. React to that. So Amarantha keeps dishing out the worst affectable, you know, the worst horrible torture and thinks that that's the one to go for. Oh, Amarantha, she hates to be tickled. Like, come on, something. Some stupid piece of easy-ass torture compared to all the other horrible things. Well, I don't want to watch it and be sad. Fuck off, Tamlin. Fuck off. <laughs> You're so selfish. Okay, but here's the good thing. Even though she should be dead, uh, she's not. True. Because they kind of sort of cheated and recent helped her how do you feel about that a win's a win abby a win is a win that's how i feel a win's a win that's how you feel amarantha seems like she plays dirty as it is so a win's a win right i don't care you're talking about life and death a win is a win in this situation another thing that i loved was when pharaoh realizes like there's a possibility amarantha doesn't know she can't read yeah this could have all just been a really horrible dumb luck on amarantha's end coincidence yeah which i don't want to say is funny because that's mean to pharaoh but it's kind of funny and reese and being a jerk about it being a smart ass being like is it going to be as painful when I, if i task you to learn how to read as it looks today i was like you butthead but also i like meanie heads you know what i thought though when he did that was that he just saw her almost completely shatter and break down in front of Amarantha. I wondered if he was making himself the bad guy to give her something to be mad about instead of something to be broken about. Well, my favorite quote, Libby. Oh, bring and it the out. entire chapter yes. is at the very end, the very, very end of chapter 40, last page on page bloop, bloop, bloop. That's not the page number. Hold on. Doop, doop, doop. I like it. Uh, bloop, bloop, bloop. It's on page 369. <clears throat> I'm not a child. <laughs> I thought it. It took me a long while to realize that Resand, whether he knew it or not, had effectively kept me from shattering completely. He's not an idiot. He knows what he's doing. I think he knew it. Yep. He's too smart. We can all see. She keeps talking about he's playing games. He's got schemes. We all know it. He doesn't do things unintentionally. I think absolutely he knows it. I'm glad that he's giving her something to focus on besides what I call the anxiety spiral the doom spiral, which happened multiple times in this chapter. And he snapped her out of it each time. And whenever I get in my anxiety doom spiral, my husband's the one that does that. Mm -hmm. And so I could honestly relate to it, even if it's a way you don't want. Yeah. Stopping that spiral is what you need at the moment. And Resand has now done that effectively within a day twice. My husband has bought me the weighted blankets. He will sit there and just like let me sob sometimes you need that person and skylar is absolutely that person and i'm glad you have james to be that person and i'm glad pharaoh right now has the high lord of the night court let's not forget that it's theoretically the meanest man in Perinthian. nah he's he's her weighted blanket that's what i'm thinking <laughs> That's all he is. He's a weighted blanket. What are you talking about? He is the thing that is keeping her attached and tethered to the world, holding her firmly in place, grounding her and keeping her mentally intact to get through all these horrible events. And that's the stance I'm choosing to take. I'm choosing to think Rhysan, even though he's a villain, is the villain that we, we want him to be. He's he's the he's the secret hero, villain turned here, you know? You know, he's he's the hero we Do need. you have a favorite quote? I do. <laughs> it was in my chapter. Does it have to do with Resand? <laughs> it does. Abby, how'd you know? <laughs> oh my <laughs> god. Who would have thought? I, I'm sorry. I love the baddies. Morally gray. There we go. Morally gray is your favorite color. I don't like a hero where you're like, oh, he's a hero. No, Tamlin's a shithole. He's not a fun baddie. You like smart asses. Yes. Ah. Uh, yes. I I liked Lucian before Resand came into it. You know, Resand, mm -hmm. he takes the crown here he you can't get better than that in my tablet it's page 317 it is in chapter 39 it says his teeth were far too near to my throat and i'll remember precisely where my hands have been but if anyone else touches you let's say a certain high lord who enjoys springtime i'll know he flicked my nose and pharah he added his voice a caressing murmur I don't like my belongings being tampered with. Ooh, chills. I liked it. Don't like my belongings being tampered That is a little territorial for me. It was, but I don't know. I liked the way he spoke. The little nose flick. 
I think he was trying to paint an image there of basically like, I don't want his hands on you type thing. And it was, yeah. I, it was kind of cute. But also like, if someone talked to me like that in real life, like I, I wouldn't like it. I was about to say, if your husband said, I don't like sharing, you'd be like, give me your food. <laughs> I want to bite. No, see, okay. Those are two. No, if my husband was like, I don't like sharing when it comes to us in a relationship or like, anything uh, romantic or further I, I i don't either i don't sh- i don't want to share that either but if he was like you belong to me i'd be like I, you need to back real hard the fuck up like whoa i'd be like i belong to myself thanks my dude i think it is way more romantic for someone to be like i choose to be here with you not i belong to you someone who is choosing every day to be with you. Can I tell you something really cheesy? Please do. I can, I'm going to ramble otherwise. Please do. So at this point, y'all, I don't care if you know who I am. My husband's last name's Adkins, right? Okay. And so you're saying actively choose the person that, y- y- you know, you're with? Yeah. We're really cheesy. And so like whenever we have a fight or something afterwards, our wedding thing was forever in Adkins instead of forever and always. Aww. So it's kind of like the I choose you thing. Yeah. And so... At the end of a fight, we'll, I'll kind of be like him and I'll be like, forever? <laughs> like, oh. <laughs> I know we had a fight and I know you're mad at me, but like forever. And he goes, and Adkins. Don't make me like you right now. <laughs> He's like, that's really cute. Shut up. Damn it. So yes, choosing somebody over and over and over again instead of being like, you're mine. I don't even like Valentine's Day cards that say like, you're mine gross no hey abby what can you tell us about our star of the week we do have a lovely star of the week this week i am actually so excited for the star of the week libby because i forgot to tell you you know how we wanted to get a tattoo that says like calls to like like calls to like and it's the pointing yes so i'm gonna hire the star of the week to do the design for that tattoo <gasps> yes so next year when we're together and we get it please we need this tattoo we need it her name's love little nikki and uh, I have a personal attachment to her because she's going to design Libby and I's new tattoo. But Nikki would like for me to read her about me section, her little blurb. So she says, greetings. I'm love little Nikki, an artist hailing from the mystical Pacific Northwest in Canada. When I think of PNW, I think of two things, Libby. One, my editing preset pack that I yes. use all the time in, in the living room. Uh, two, I only think of Washington, which is in the US. So I was like, I forgot that existed in Canada. (laughs) Great. Okay. She continues saying, my artistic journey took flight in 2016 when I first picked up a pencil, but it wasn't until 2020 that I turned my passion into a thriving business. Inspired by the beauty of nature and the celestial wonders above, I've channeled these forces into my work. What sets me apart is my unique ability to merge the tranquility of the Pacific Northwest with the enchantment of the cosmos in my artwork, creating a blend that speaks to both the heart and the soul. Join me as we embark on a captivating artistic journey on the A Court of Thorns and Roses podcast. I didn't start akatar based work until I received a commission one day from my amazing client, Sierra, commissioned me to create a sword with the crescent moon, Volaris skyline, and dragons. She explained that it was from a multiple book series by Sarah J. Mass. This is actually one of my most stolen pieces. <gasps> no! Oh no. <laughs> Ever since then, the SJM community really accepted my work and wanted to see me create more. I eventually was doing so many SJM commissions that I decided to finally buy a cord of thorns and roses <laughs> from my local bookshop. This was at the end end of August. I was so entangled in the story, I purchased the whole book set before I even finished the first book. I was so obsessed that I flew through the series in about 20 days. Girl, Mm -hmm. that is impressive. I think the catalyst of my work in the SGM world was my collaboration with a few authors, including the fantasy and romance authors Holly, Renee, and Emma Hamm. My collaboration with Emma was through the book subscription box, the bookish box. I've done a few books with them, and I am in the works for a fifth book in the Dungeons of Umbra series. All of the first four books are completely designed by me from the dust cover to the chapter headers. That is amazing. My work with Holly is more personal and one-on-one. I've designed a special three book omnibus for the star and shadow series, which she uses for book signings. Have you seen the cover work for that? No, but I'm going to look at it after. Is it beautiful? Yes. So pretty. I've designed special three book omnibus for the stars and shadow series, which she used for book signings as well as bookmarks and pins. I'm currently collaborating with her again for another omnibus, but I can't give away too many details about that as we are very fresh into the process. 
project. I think down the line, I'd love to collaborate with Sarah J. Mass. I'm thinking of releasing sticker packs based on each of the novels of the Akatar series. I just haven't had time to design anything to submit for licensing. It's a goal of mine this fall and winter to at least start on the first sticker pack. So stay tuned for that. I'd like to thank your podcast hosts, Abby and Libby, for reaching out and featuring me on this episode. I just want to say she spelled her names right. And um, that is amazing. That's impressive. If you're interested in getting custom work or tattoo designs, please don't hesitate to reach out to me and give me a follow at love little Nikki on Instagram. Well, girlfriend, we are already following you and I will be reaching out here in the near future to get that tattoo design because obviously we like SJM. I'm just in shock. I didn't know she designed Holly Renee's book covers. Those books are like exploding too. That I ooh, love little Nikki. Good for you, girl. Those are beautiful. Right? I can so tell it's her work now. I hope our tattoos look even 1% as cool as that. Oh, and girl, I just want to tell you, don't even worry. Your cover is being printed in Italian too. Un regno di stella e ombre. Okay. Thank you. That's the Italian. So guys, please go give my favorite tattoo artist in the world a follow. You will not forget it. Calling all dreamers. We want to hear from you. Send us an email to Accord of Thorns and Podcasts at gmail.com. Slide into our Instagram DMs and tell us everything. How you found the series, your favorite characters, or questions you have for us. Also, Abby, mm-hmm. speaking of which, we've gotten a few emails with questions. We have. Yes, I, I have one. Friends. And we're not ignoring you. No. We are not ignoring you. But I wanted to bring up this one real quick because I really appreciated this. This was from an email from Allie. Uh, she says, here's my question. Obviously, most of us are night court dreamers. Yes, girl. Yes. But excluding the night court, which court would you be a part of and why? <sighs> The contemplation, I feel it. I want to say Autumn Court because I am as basic as you can get. I'm never happier than an October day, right? Excluding like the whole king and family issue, I would be Autumn Court because I also walk around smelling like roasted chestnuts. So that's my answer and I hate it. (laughs) So I will continue being a member of the Night Court. Thank you very much. What about you? I would have to say winter court you hate being cold i thought i did i thought i did but now living where i've lived with the (laughs) intense heat uh yeah i do like i like the beach i like the water i think we i'd be willing to deal with the the heat like this for disney purposes but (laughs) disney purposes only (laughs) other than that I like the Winter Court. I like the High Lord and the Lady of the Winter Court, which we will learn about later on in different books. I like their little bear animal things. They just seem like a very kind, accepting (laughs) court to live in. I think I'd be really happy there. And I bet they have some sort of like Aurora Borealis type thing. And then I figured, you know what, let's just, we got another one, really easy question, I'll ask it, and I will let you answer. Okay. This is from Lou Freya. She says, I was just wondering what song you play at the beginning of the podcast. I absolutely love it and want to add it to my playlist on Spotify. Oh, girl. Let me just say, my husband has it on his Spotify playlist. Totally understand. Abby? Not Afraid of the Dark by Arcana. Check her out, please. I think it's actually just called The Dark. I think it is The Dark. It's, it's the, definitely I, called I mean, yeah. The Dark yes. by Arcana. But girl, go on YouTube, go on Spotify. She has a page. It was just her birthday the other day, too. It so was, yeah. Wish her a happy birthday. Add her to your playlist. She is our favorite. So yeah, send us questions. We love to answer them. We were super excited to hear from you guys. Also, if you guys like us even a little bit, go ahead and leave us a review, maybe. I don't know. You're feeling it. No, you do you. I'll okay. beg. I'll get on my knees for you. On uh, Apple Podcasts or rating on Spotify to help us find more of our bookish friends. I mean, if you don't like us, you can. I mean, it's not our favorite thing. I'm not going to tell you not to. You know, freedom of like speech and whatnot. Do what you want to do. But I'm telling you not to. It'd be a lot nicer if you left something great to say. That'd be, <laughs> be more appreciated. To the people who listen and the dreams that are answered. We'll see you next week. And remember, don't let the hard days win. From the dark, there's a man on the fly. Makes me taking all my feelings. You in my head, you in my heart.
I'm not afraid of dark. Rhysand forewarned her that he did. What? Nope. That that changed it. He did, he did what? What? What did he do? <laughs> that he did. He did. That's all you need to know. <laughs> the end he of the that. chapter. It's Dias, right? Dias? I think so. Dias? It is now. We're making it. Yeah, I've changed the pronunciation.